All right, so we're here today again going into, I think, nuclear chemistry uh, lecture three. I want to start by going over the uh, form that some of y'all did. Um, and uh, I do want to touch on some things that people didn't, didn't do as well as I thought they could have. All right, um, so let me just uh, get here and let me just uh, share my screen. And we'll share that, boom. And we'll go on to uh, the nuclear chem form. All right, I see myself upper corner. Okay, so uh, any case, um, most of you guys did pretty well. 100% to the right tells you, uh, of course, how well you, um, the class did, correct? 75% uh, of the students who took it said the, radio, the nucleus of a radioisotope maintains the same mass. And hold on, I need to... Um, uh, participants, uh, me too. Okay, so it's like someone's building a closet in the background, hard to focus. Okay, so in any case, um, what we're doing here is 75% got this right. Uh, the nucleus of a radio, radio isotope remains the same, and that's because a proton becomes a neutron. And I, I, I you know, this is a kind of, um, uh, and I can see why people would get this wrong. In truth, we're going to learn today that in nuclear reactions, truthfully, the mass of the system does not stay the same. There's a little bit of conversion of mass to energy. We call that mass defect. Okay. All right. Um, and so uh, in truth, maybe I shouldn't have anything here checked. Okay. So uh, if you guys are, uh, we're, we're messed up because of that, I understand. In the Regents land, we do talk about ma mass defect, meaning there's a little bit of mass missing. It's not tremendous. So if we're talking about AMU, and AMU is atomic mass units. So anytime we talk about uh, units of mass in the atom, you'll, you'll see this as AMU, okay? And so AMUs, we say for a neutron, Hey, a neutron has no charge in table O and has a mass of one. And a proton, we can write like this, has a mass of one and a charge of one. So generally speaking, we say that both the neutron and the proton have about the same mass. And so if we're considering the size of an atomic mass unit, okay, the, the nucleus doesn't really change. In truth, fraction, very small fraction of an atomic mass unit. In fact, atomic mass unit is, is so small. Uh, I, I'm talking about 10 to the negative, I don't know, was it something really small, 20 or 30 uh, of a kilogram or something uh, is what a particle of a neutron or proton is. But we're talking about a fraction of an atomic mass unit, okay, is, does miss. So I can see why people would have that. So they go back and forth. So the, in terms of rounding off atomic mass units, like we know that carbon 12 is 12.0, um, and I can't see with my glasses, 12.01. Oh, 07, but we say carbon 12, it rounds off because we have the most stable and most abundant isotope. And one of the isotopes exists in larger percentages. So that's, you know, a thing to talk about. And then all these are pretty good. And then we go to the product of these decay modes are a more stable nucleus. Too low of a percentage here, party people, too low. Okay. The reason why some nucleus by itself gives off some radioactive particle or energy is to become a new stable element. Now I say stable, it means its nucleus is more stable. We go from higher energy to lower energy. There's something wrong with the nucleus. So too many people, I'm not sure why I'm with Christmas colors here, okay, are too low in here, okay? Um, and then probably the worst question of all, Okay, uh, stabilizes an atom with an overcrowded nucleus. When you have an overcrowded nucleus, I know some people might think that's too many neutrons or too less neutron. We say overcrowded, we're really talking about the proton number, okay? And anytime you have too many protons, what do we know? Anything that has an atomic number greater than 83, that element has no, no isotopes that are stable. Every single form of that element, okay, is radioactive because there's too much stuff in the nucleus, particularly protons. So overcrowding, okay, really talks about there's just the nucleus is too big. And we're going to talk about today that even very, very large nuclei become stable, okay, when they can split into smaller nuclei. Remember, what keeps the atom together is something called binding energy. 
all right? And that's, and that's messing with something called the strongest force in nature. We've talked about that, okay? Um, and that strongest force in nature because, well, scientists don't really have a great, uh, I guess, uh, creative writing part of their brain <laughs> called a strong force. And when you mess with that strong force, okay, there's a tremendous amount of energy, just like your homework. You learn that the most energy released is from nuclear reactions because we're messing around with that binding energy, okay? Any case, uh, so some, uh, some pieces there. Very good for you guys on the bottom here figuring out um, – uh, who uh, uh, phosphorus and radon, notice I had to give you an exactly the nucleotide. You went to table N and I like the fact that when I gave you guys nucleotides that were on table N, you were able to use your understanding. Hey, carbon normally is carbon 12. How do I know? Because it's 12.01, it rounds off to 12 because most of carbon is carbon 12. So carbon 11 is under that number. So then you have under the number of neutrons because carbon has what to be carbon six protons. So that was good. Uh, and in fact, I don't even have a check here. I'm not sure why. All right. Uh, so I'm not sure if I have that even right. Uh, so carbon 12, okay, uh, is under. So that would be um, positron decay. That should be a check there. I'm not sure why that's not there. All right, so that's positron decay in the house there. Okay, and then nickel 63, you go to nickel and you see atomic number 58 point something. That rounds to uh, 59. So, hey, I have too many neutrons and therefore that'd be beta decay and that would be this check here. So I was good, about, those are some good things there. And then I ended you off, ended you off. Um, and then one more point I wanted to make uh, as we go through this, um, is that in these examples here, these examples here, notice you only have one element or one nucleotide before the arrow. So these are all spontaneous by themselves. They don't need an input of energy. Now, what would be that input of energy? Slamming it with another particle, right? That would be the particle accelerator. So all of these are example of what? natural transmutation. What's the word transmutation? Is when a nucleus becomes a more stable nucleus by emitting a particle. In this case, we would be giving off a helium nucleus, okay, when you do the math on the top and the bottom. We use a law of conservation of charge and mass, but uh, there is a little bit of tiny mass missing. We'll get to that. All of these reactions emit energy. They're warm. That's what's weird about this phenomenon is that you have these um, self-sustaining reactions that are warm to the touch. In fact, if you remember Marie Curie, they're figuring out why does radium actually glows by itself? You know, uranium is warm and it's because of these nuclear reactions. A little bit of mass missing goes to energy. We'll talk about that. But these are all natural transmutation or all spontaneous. I would need to see two K nuclei, uh, nucleotides or uh, nuclei here to slam into each other. That's what the particle accelerators are for. We talked about that. We use energy to fly them together. Well, why? Because they're both positive nuclei. So we build these particle accelerators. That's unnatural. That's artificial. And that would be non-spontaneous because we know that from the RIC, Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider from Brookhaven National Lab, gold ions don't smash in nature normally. Okay, so we've got to force that to happen with energy and the energy that we put in creates the particles. Okay, so that was that there. And also getting back to this that messed up some people, um, these alpha, beta and positron decay are all examples of natural transmutation. Okay, whereas gamma decay is not because if you remember gamma decay, all right, something to understand here. Okay, you're not going to change the particle. So even though I may have circled this here, C, all right, this is not natural transmutation. Transmutation means that through the release of some kind of radioactive particle, your nucleus changes to become more stable. Of course, that's a driving force, okay? Since this is the same nucleus, we don't call it transmutation. All right, so in any case, all right, those that are late, uh, that didn't do the form, are not going to get the hundreds because I gave away some secrets here, so they'll have a deduction. So that's how that goes. All right, so back to reality. I'm going to go now. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to end. Oh, Christmas, where did I go? Uh, let's go back here. Okay. And let's, I'm going to stop my share and hi again. Okay, now we're going to go share my screen. All right. Uh...
we go share the screen again and I'm going to go share and then I'm going to go to here okay now this is the presentation that I want to uh, go back up on and we're, we left off with um, half-lives so we went through the particle accelerators and we're left off here so let me just present booyah okay so we're talking about half-life today, and so radioactive elements decay, change, or transmutate into um, another stable particle. And what we have here is half-life problems. We know that um, half-life problems are a major part of uh, these types of um, reactions, or I should say nuclear changes, right? It's not a chemical reaction. Now, some people like to use this formula, whereas they give the fraction remaining okay is to time period where t is the time elapsed over the half-life when i teach this I, I really think we're overthinking it if we use this formula okay but in any case half-life for those that don't remember the ap part of the curriculum is a time required for one half of a given radioactive element to decay change or transmutate into another compound okay uh and so there's a way to do this using this formula but i'm not a big fan Okay, uh, and maybe some people are more mathematical than me and say that they love this, but the fraction remaining, time elapsed, and here's the half-life, and you can do all that. Uh, I'm a big fan of just using a chart or just using your brain because these are very simple questions. Okay, so we go back to table N, the last table. Na 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 na, hey hey hey, table N. Okay, and so we all know that they give you the decay mode, which if you go to table O, it'll tell you that's that's a beta, that's a positron, that's an alpha. Okay, but of course the half life we just said is half the time it takes for it to decay. Now, if you notice, some of the half lives are short, some of them are very long. That's something you need to be careful of in this region's part of the curriculum. Longer half lives obviously are going to take a lot long for you to decay into something more stable. And of course, things with short half-lives are going to more quickly decay into more stable and safer components. Some of these shorter half-life com um, compounds we actually use in nuclear medicine. Iodine-131 is actually used as a diagnostic tool um, to, uh, to work with potentially the thyroid since there's an uptake. So it actually gives off beta particles, which are dangerous, but it also actually will give off some um, gamma radiation to image. So they give you small amounts and they, again, give you things with very low half-life so they decay in your body. And that's a question that comes up, okay? And we also talked about uh, PET scans, positron emission topography, where we give you, uh, I believe, a fluorine um, a fluorine radioactive nucleotide that's undergoing positron decay, right? It uh, has two less neutrons, okay? So uh, a proton uh, becomes a neutron. Any case, the bottom line here is in positron decay, that, that positron hits an electron because it's antimatter and makes a uh, gamma radiation. We can also image the brain too. So, uh, and, and any nucleotide that we put in your body for any kind of imaging, or for any time of diagnostic, the tool normally has longer half-lives. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, has shorter half-lives to get out of your body. I'm, I'm thinking about my head, cobalt 60, or some other, unfortunately, longer half-life um, medicines that we give to um, uh, cancer patients, part of chemotherapy, where we give them really, really terrible compounds, even though we're giving them small amounts, okay? You can see cobalt-60 is used in cancer treatments, part of chemotherapy, I believe. And that idea there is um, that's supposed to hopefully kill the cancer before it, it kills the individual, all right? So um, any case, um, so not everything you put in the body has uh, short half-lives, diagnostic tools that we don't want to hurt the individual does. Uh, cobalt-60 is a, is a cancer-related treatment to try to kill tissue, whereas the shorter half-lives that we use as a diagnostic tool or imaging tool are not there to kill tissue. It's there to image, so we want them to have short half-lives, an important distinction. Okay, so for those that are with me from AP Chemistry, you know that first order, hey, this is carbon-14 emits a beta particle. You know because it has what? Too many neutrons. So a neutron becomes a proton, emits the negative part called the electron out from the nucleus. And of course, a neutrino with their, we don't show here in this course. Okay, but the point is this, okay, is by itself changing. This is 
first order decay. And if you remember, ooh, our formula for, and we, we remember we derived this, okay? This is the natural log of two over the rate law constant. Notice the concentration isn't involved, which means if you remember the half-life state constant. If you go to table and you'll see the half-life of carbon-14 is of course 5,000 plus years. In fact, it's 5,730 years. Okay, so it takes that long for whatever starting amount of carbon-14 you have to decay in half. So if I had a uh, 100 gram sample of it, it would take 5,730 years for it, for it to now become 50 grams. What happened to the first 50? Hey, it became nitrogen, safe nitrogen. And of course, there's going to be half as much carbon-14 related. And of course, we use carbon-14 to actually date, okay, to age organic material. Organic material, uh, like cloth and fibers, okay, when they're made in nature, have a, a, a certain amount of natural carbon-14. And over time, they lose that carbon-14. So we can actually age how much carbon-14, by knowing how much carbon-14 is left, we're able to actually use the half-life, which stays constant, to age material. Very famous example of aging uh, organic material, carbon-based material, is the Shroud of Turan, which supposedly, and I'm not here to judge anyone's belief or uh, support or not support anyone's belief, is the Shroud of Jesus, right? So that should be over 2,000 years old. And so they've done carbon dating on those kind of things to see if, in fact, they were. In fact, it's a real important story. They, they, took, the car, they took a little bit of a fiber and measured the carbon-14 left, knowing how much it should have if it was, what, um, made that year at 0%. They aged it not to be 2,000 years old. And then they went back about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And then they went inside and took a fiber from side. And they actually measured it based upon how much missing carbon-14. And using the half-life, which is constant, they aged to be about 2,000 years old. Okay, That doesn't prove that it was the Shroud of Jesus, but it does prove that it was made during that time period. What's, so it gives them some credence there. But any case, um, so we talked about this. Any case, moving on. All right, so now what we have now are the half-life problems. In fact, we had some in AP, and they're pretty simple. I like when I teach half-life problems to use a chart. I call it a zero timeline. And the reason why I call it a zero timeline is because it's good to know that at zero time, okay, starting just right before the um, sample that's radioactive starts to decay and go down in the remaining amount of nucleotide, we know there's zero time, zero half-lives have occurred, and we have 100% of the sample. So here's a question, okay, that was missing in your questions that I gave you before. If eight grams of cobalt-60, that's the nucleotide we use in, in a cancer treatments, right? Uh, in 1990, which year were the remaining amount of cobalt-60 be 0.5 grams? Okay, so what we're saying is we're starting with eight grams at zero time, zero time before it started to decay, okay, in 1990. How long will it take for that eight grams of cobalt 60 to become, uh, uh, remain to 0.5, meaning eight grams decays into 0.5? How long will it take? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is draw a number line, okay? Uh, and I'll get that in a second. Now, I did go to table N. Now, when I click table N, I get this little chart on the bottom. And eventually, it tells me that the second number is 5.26 years, okay? That's the half-life. But I need to find how many halvings have occurred. So what I'm going to do is draw a number line. Now, I don't need all this data, but I'm just showing you from teaching. I know that zero time has occurred when I had originally eight grams of this radioisotope. Zero half-lives have occurred. Havings. I call half-life a having, right? And I have 100% of the sample or have one over one. Sometimes I'll use fractions. Sometimes it's a percentage. Any case, we know we're going to 0.5. So what I'm going to do is take my eight grams and I'm going to divide in half. That'll give me four. That's the first half-life, okay? And so that's what I'm doing here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep having until I get 0.5 grams. They always give you a whole number here, okay? And find out how many half-lives. So that's what I'm going to do here. So in the first half-life, I have this. Notice that's 
a half of one is half, 50%. I don't need this here. I'm just showing you. And I also put in the half lifetime of 5.26 years, which is going to be cumulative, right? Or going to add up. And then I'm going to take the hand. Now, what am I doing? I'm going to keep having and get to 0.5 to see how many half lives. Okay. Second half life. Hey, what's half of four, two? Okay, that'd be 25% of the sample. Hey, that'd be one fourth because half of two. All right. And of course, I added another 5.26 years. Okay. Hey, but I'm not at 0.5 yet. So I have again. Hey, half of two is one. And then to get to 0.5, I have to do one more halving. So four halvings have occurred. And so what I would do with the four half-lifes, again, I don't need this. Okay, I'm just showing you other questions can say, well, what fraction remains? And that would be at 1 16th remains, right? I'm having, okay. But any case, four halvings have occurred. Each halving is 5.26 years. So four times 5.26 is 21 years. So it took 21.04 years for the eight grams of the radioisotope to become 0.5 remaining. The rest of it, of course, decayed into a more stable isotope. And they want to know what year. So, well, we take the 21 and we add it to 1990 and you get 2011 choice four. Okay. And that's how that works. Pretty simple stuff. Some people can do this in their head. Other people need to see the graph, okay? And by the way, we did have some of these simple problems in our review, uh, okay, in our AP review. Okay, so here we go, another half-life problem. What is the total number of hours required for potassium-42 to undergo three half-life periods? Okay, what's the number? Well, if we just knew the half-life of potassium-42, wouldn't we just times that by three, right? I want to go, th remember the half-life periods are constant. All of these things that we're going to see here is uh, uh, first order half-lives because it's by itself. So I go to table N and I see that there's 12.4 hours. So I don't need really a chart here, but you can see that three halvings would occur and it'd be 37.2. That's just three times 12.4. Okay, I think we can get that. If you know the half-life, you times it by three. It's going to stay constant. It's first order. All of these are first order. Okay, so you really didn't need a graph there. Okay, moving forward. And again, table N is your friend. All right, so you come some more for fun. And table N is your friend here. I have a sample of a radioactive substance with original mass of 16 grams. It was studied for eight hours. Nice round numbers. When the study was completed, only four grams remained of the radioactive. What is the half-life of the substance? Well, how many halvings occurred? How did it, how many halvings occurred from go to 16 to four? Okay, and if you don't know that, do your graph. At 16 grams, no time, there was a, no half-lives, no radioactivity has occurred in this fictitious zero line, but it's important. And in our first halving, we have eight, and our second halving, we have two. So two halvings have occurred. Well, if two halvings have occurred or two half-lives have occurred in eight hours, well, then each half-life is four hours, okay? And these are regents, New York State regents level half-life questions, okay? So I hope you can get those and then just some practice. Here comes another question. A sample of I-131, we use this radioisotope to uh, medically diagnose, uh, diagnose some thyroid issues in humans. Okay, it's got a very short half-life. We talked about that. Has an original mass of 16. How much remain after 24 days? Well, how much will it decay to? Okay, well, you have 16 grams. Well, how many halvings? Well, all we have is total time. In the other problems, okay, you may have figured out half-life, but we need the half-life here. Okay, so we go to table N. And what's it tell us? Hey, the half-life is eight days. Oh, okay. We have 24 total days. So how many halvings have occurred? Okay, well, 24. All right, divided by eight is three halvings. So we're going to have it three times. And so we take a 16. We have it, oops, I guess I'm going to do this. Eight days is the first halving. Two half-lives and three half-lives. So we have it three times. Okay, so it took 24 days. And again, how did I know 24 days? And how did I know that eight days? I had to look up. I'm sorry, I had to look up the half-life. So in 24 days was the total time. The half-life was eight. So I do the division. I find three halvings have occurred, 16 having three times. Now, the reason why I like the zero line is some people would say one, two, and three. No, no, there's no half-lives here. So that's why I like the line. This is the first. This is the zero. 
one, two, three, so two grams remained, okay? All right, uh, here's another one. Um, so this one I like because it goes the other way. And I'll explain by that is look at the question. A sample was found that came 2.0 milligrams of carbon-14. This we use, of course, to um, date, okay, organic material. How many grams of carbon-14 were there in the sample 11,460 years ago? Okay, so they want to know what the original sample is at zero time or zero halvings. We want to go back up. So they're telling me that two milligrams remaining. So I'm down here. And so to go to find the original, instead of having to go down, we're going to double back up to the zero line. Okay, so uh, the first thing I do is I go to table and I find the half-life is 5,000. Uh, 730 years is the half-life of carbon-14. That's why we use it for carbon dating. Okay, it's such a big, big half-life. There's going to be some carbon-14 remaining. Any case. Okay, so we go take our total time, and we're going to divide by the 5,700 to find how many halvings occurred. So that's what I'm doing here. So I took the total time, and I divide by the half-lives, and what I get is two half-lives have transpired. Okay, so that means I halved twice to get to that number, which means I'm gonna double back up. So I take my, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna take my original uh, two milligram sample. I know two half-lives occurred and I'm just gonna go double back up. And notice I don't stop here. A lot of students would stop right here at four. Okay, because this is one, two, no, no. This is the first half-life. That's why it's really nice to have the chart. To go to the zero half-lives, so I keep going. Okay, you notice at zero half-lives and zero years when it was brand new and never uh, uh, giving off particles, eight milligrams. So, be, uh, so two milligrams remaining after 11,460 years, that means that we started with eight milligrams, okay, that many years ago if two half-lives occurred. So that's how we do that. So in this problem, I started you and you double back up to the zero line, okay? So there you go. All right, and if you want more practice, here we have it. I have a lecture to go, that goes over this if you need to, okay? And I believe it's these problems as well. So uh, enjoy if you need to continue on, but it's, it's, it's that simple. All right, so we're moving on now to uh, other forms of artificial transmutation. And we're getting into um, uh, the, the, the final reactions of nuclear chemistry fission and fusion. And I don't know how far we're going to get because I don't want to take up too much time here because I'm long-winded with this long body. Okay, so a couple of things to realize here that we're talking about is that we're using Einstein's E equals MC squared. He was first to talk about that energy and matter were interconverted. They weren't just separate. And he says that all matter could be converted to energy somehow. And a little bit of matter times the speed of light squared gives you a tremendous energy. Now, the reason why we use this equation, okay, is because we were able to, um, we were able to um, really verify Einstein's uh, very famous equation here in nuclear chemistry, meaning that, as I said before, there's a little bit of mass missing in every single nuclear equation, whether it's alpha, beta, okay, positron decay, Although the atomic mass unit values stay constant because you round up, there's actually a little bit of missing mass in those reactions, a fraction of an atomic mass unit, okay? A fraction of a neutron if you want to think about it. But if you take that fraction of a very small mass and you times it by the speed of light, which is a huge number, and you square that number, take a small, small number and multiply the speed of light squared, you're going to get a big energy and that's where the energy comes from in nuclear okay reactions the changing of the mass and somehow binding energy okay in the nucleus that keeps the protons together all right has some sort of mass as that binding energy is lowered okay or increased so does the mass of the atom so there's some interchange of energy to mass okay and that's called mass defect so although we say that the mass of the uh, there's a conservation of amus when we do nuclear equations to figure out if it's a beta particle positron just be aware that all nuclear reactions have some missing mass and that missing mass here relates to 
energy changes. And the more mass missing gives you more energy. Okay. Now, in order, uh, so there really isn't an ordinary chemical reactions missing mass. We say it's what conservation of mass. But in nuclear chemistry, that mass becomes significant. Okay. So here comes the first reaction, probably the one I'm going to spend most of the time on today. We're going to talk about nuclear fission, and this is splitting of the atom. Okay. And so um, it was first done in, I believe, the late, uh, I think the 30s, um, in a, a squash court in Chicago, and they had the first sustaining nuclear fission. Um, and what they did, and it's important to realize that fission is a splitting of an atom, and you need to be able to identify this form. Uh, what we take is a small moving neutron, and we take a fissionable, large, large nucleus. Notice uranium-92 is an unstable nucleus because it's overcrowded. It's got 92 protons and tremendous amount of neutrons. The energy that it takes to pull this together is failing, so to speak. It's hard to keep this uranium together. That's why uranium loves to give off a, what? An alpha particle to get stable. Now, it's important to realize that there are three to four fissionable, okay, um, isotopes, meaning not all things can fission, okay? So it's important to realize that to begin, but there are certain isotopes of elements, and uranium is one of them, where if a small moving neutron, and a neutron works because it doesn't have a charge, so it's able to hit, it can split that big atom, which is having a hard time keep, it's an unstable high energy nucleus, hard to keep all those protons together. And so therefore, if it's hit by a slow moving neutron, it can split into smaller fragments. These smaller fragments, of course, are more stable. They're not overcrowded anymore. So unstable to stable. So some nucleotides can be split into more stable, smaller nucleotides. So notice a very large atom, a neutron, splits into smaller fragments. Okay, remember all of these numbers in the bottom, okay, will what add up? So 56 plus 36 is 92. And then of course, 143 plus 90, now it's three neutrons. So three plus three gives you 236, right? So all, all those masses equal each other on both sides, even though there is missing mass, okay? It's important to realize that. And there's tremendous amount of energy released here because there is more missing mass, okay? Uh, uh, that is, um, uh, missing in fission than in alpha or beta decay, okay? Now, it's interesting to note that in uranium, the slow-moving neutron can be split into these particles and three more neutrons, okay? And, and these three more neutrons can do what? Split another uranium nucleus, and you can see a chain reaction can actually be made. And if we control the chain reaction, that's what a nuclear reactor is. And if we have an uncontrollable chain reaction, if you have enough mass, okay, um, uh, of the fuel, that is what an atomic bomb is, okay? And of course, the atomic bombs that we dropped in World War II and Nagasaki and Hiroshima were example of this uncontrollable chain reaction to generate tremendous amount of energy in a small time, okay? Now, uh, so it's important to realize that this is an example of artificial transmutation. Want to think about it, but it's a very, very important reaction that we control that we control for nuclear reactors. Okay. Any case, here's an example of a nice picture to show that this could uh, engage or have a uncontrollable chain reaction. Here are the only known fissional materials on Earth. I think I have them correct here. Notice uranium-233 and 235 are the only fissionable forms of uranium. And by the way, if you notice, you look up uranium, and I can't see from my periodic table, um, it, um, it averages out to uranium-238, which means most uranium is 238, which means most uranium is not fissionable, okay? And so if you ever hear the word dirty bomb, people who take uranium, that's not weapons grade. Weapons grade uranium would be uranium 233 or 235. That can be fissioned and that can be made into an uncontrollable chain reaction. 
So when you think about weapons grade uranium, what do we do? Well, we take uranium out of the ground and we enrich it. And basically enrichment basically means is we sift out the lighter uranium and leave the heavy. And that's a really important procedure. Okay, and so making uranium weapons grade fuel, whether you use it for a bomb or a trigger for a hydrogen bomb, right? we don't make atomic bombs anymore, but we use the atomic explosion here to actually trigger what we call a fusion bomb, hydrogen bomb. So we still use them obviously in our warheads and we still use them in reactors, okay? So, so whether you are enriching uranium for a nuclear reactor or for a weapon, that was all the talk about uh, Iran is, 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 is that they were using technology to enrich uranium. They were of course saying that we're making it for commercial energy purposes in a nuclear power plant. And everyone else said, well, they could be using it for a bomb and, and you don't know it's the same materials, okay? But the bottom line is you take these four uh, fissional materials and with a slow moving neutron, you make smaller fragments that are more stable. And again, more neutrons are emitted. And this isn't the only, uh, there's several different ways to write fission, as long as the fragments e equal all the way up to the individual masses here, even though we know mass is missing, okay? So it's a splitting of a large atom into smaller atoms and some of that binding energy, okay, all right, is converted, uh, you know, lost as mass, okay? Or some mass is missing as the energy is released from the system, okay? However you wanna think about it, all right? And it is kind of weird to think about that, but there's an interconnectivity of energy into matter and matter into energy. And that of course was all the work of the, um, uh, of the uh, atom smash as we talked about to find that particle, that Higgs boson, right? That was part of that transfer, okay? If you're in a Higgs field and I don't wanna get too crazy about all this other stuff. So it is a mind blowing a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about this, okay? So weapons grade uranium, okay, is uranium 233 to 235. Now, one of the early ways, the Manhattan Project, which was a project to build an atomic bomb, if you didn't know about the Manhattan Project, it was a race to build an atomic bomb before uh, Nazi Germany did. Supposedly, they were on their way to build one. We later found out they weren't that close. So we felt we had to do that. So all of the nuclear physicists of the day uh, created this Manhattan secret project to build them. We actually built three. One, we tested a Trinity project and two that we dropped eventually in World War II to end it. And we'll talk more about that. All right. Um, so this is all involved in your history of that. Okay. So in any case, um, I want to play this a little bit for you. This talks about uh, why don't we use, um, you know, uh, Rutherford's uh, alpha particles? Why don't we just shoot alpha particles at uranium? So I'm going to play this, um, and and I probably will get uh, get striked because of the copyright violation, but I can cut it out later. Oh, Christmas in July. That's not what I want to do. I can do this. Here we go. Alpha particles consist of two protons and two neutrons and carry a positive electric charge. The theory was that by smashing these particles in the nucleus, they might blast it apart, converting some of the mass into energy. Because the nucleus of the target atom. And, and that is why, of course, party people, we needed atom smashers. You need tremendous energy to overcome that. I'm sorry. I had to put that in there. And ah, uh, Christmas in July. Oh, uh, what am I doing? All right. Uh, so cool beans, the beans are chilled. So there it is, and all in a nutshell, splitting of the atom. Okay. Still and you still hear me? Anyone? Anyone still there? <laughs> Talking to no one? Hello? Anyone? 
Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. So now we're going to talk about some nuclear reactors. Okay. So nucle nuclear power plants, and we're surrounded by them in the Northeast. Okay. Use nuclear fission. We split. Okay. Weapons grade uranium. Okay. And of course, uranium that we build that we take out of the ground. Okay. Mostly is uranium two thirty eight, not usable. We have to basically find a two thirty uranium two thirty three or two. 35. One of the ways we should do it is bond it with fluorine gas, right? Make a uranium fluoride and have that gas move through chambers. And the heavier forms, uranium-238, would move slower through the chambers. And the lighter ones by what? Graham's law of diffusion or effusion would move through the chambers of the cartridges faster, okay? And then we would take the fluorine off and that was one of the ways. So the Manhattan Project uh, had to make enough and part of the problem was was enriching the uranium and they used uh two uranium bombs and one plutonium bomb any case let's talk about a nuclear power plant okay nuclear power plants um for the wonder they have is that and there are some advantages and disadvantages you have to know major 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 advantages here is that uranium if you have the enriched or the weapons grade, okay, gives off tremendous amount of energy without giving off CO2 a, 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 or any kind of emissions that are poor. We burn fuel, whether it's coal or natural gas or um, uh, fuel oil. We're also emitting CO2, which is of course a greenhouse gas, but we're also emitting other components that can give us acid rain, okay? It just hurts the environment when we do so. When we use nuclear power plants, we don't have those types of emissions. So uh, it's something to think about. Okay, so here's what the basics of a nuclear power plant, all right? And, and so what you have is the reactor building. Now this core here normally is below, okay? And this core is fortified with concrete and steel and lead, uh, you know, uh, many, many feet thick to prevent the leakage of these radioactive materials. Although uranium fissions and gives off energy, okay, there's also nucleotides in here that give off gamma radiation. There's a whole bunch of other things that happen, okay? So we gotta prevent the radioactivity from escaping. All right, so in any case, what we have in the core, which is usually in the bottom, okay, or the reactor building, sometimes alongside, okay, it depends upon the structure is that we have control rods. And in these control rods, we have uranium, enriched uranium in pellets that are stuck in a rod that go into, I'm sorry, the uranium fuel rods have the uranium pellets. And basically they could be lowered in or lowered out. This is, the, this is showing the uranium fuel rods here. Um, and so what we do is we expose uranium to slow moving neutrons. And there's different ways that that can happen, okay? but essentially we expose them and the uranium hits neutrons, hits the uranium 233, 235 or plutonium. They split into fragments, they give off the energy. There's mass defect. A lot of the mass is missing, becomes energy. Okay, and so this solution filled with radioactive goop and, 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 and other fragments of things that, uh, okay, are, it gets very, very hot. And that very, very hot solution boils water that creates steam or a gas and that gas okay physically moves a turbine okay if you think of a turbine as a um uh, electrical uh device if i was to hand crank i don't know if I've ever seen those devices where you can actually hand crank and make electricity but you've seen them a lot of times these turbines are uh, on windmills and and and, and so the, the, the wind moves and it turns a crank and that crank is basically um, a copper wire around in a magnet and that movement, okay, creates electricity. So we move a turbine, that motion creates electricity and that, that's the electricity that is made from this process. And of course the gases or the evaporation comes out of this condenser, okay? And that's the basics here. Now, if you notice there's a control rod, because if you notice, if we have enough of this uranium fuel, boy, isn't there a danger to have an uncontrollable reaction? Hey, one neutron splits uh, uh, one uranium, 
but then you have three more neutrons that go out. So you could have an uncontrollable reaction if you don't control it. So nuclear power plants control the reaction by dropping a control rod. Now the control rod absorb neutrons, okay? In fact, we used to have a nuclear power plant running uh, well, two of them actually, but the one that's been around the longest, the Brookhaven National Lab had their own power plant. And what they used as what they called a moderator, which means it slowed down the uh, reaction is they used water. If you notice, water has oxygen and two hydrogens. Well, those hydrogens can absorb neutrons. Remember we had these guys, party people? Remember we talked about them? In fact, what, they were actually in your, um, uh, I wanna write here, so. Okay, I'm just going to annotate. Lost a person here. They said, forget this. Okay, so uh, we had hydrogen one, hydrogen two called deuterium, and hydrogen three. Okay, and so party people, so the water has these hydrogens, and they're hydrogen one, but because of all these neutrons, hydrogen actually can absorb them. So water was absorbing, or the hydrogens in water were absorbing the neutrons, and why would that be a good thing? So that slows down the nuclear fission. Hey, all these neutrons that are emitted from one splitting uranium could find more uranium and call an uncontrollable or cause this reaction to overheat and be uncontrollable. That's what a meltdown is. But if we absorb them, okay, then we slow the reaction down. Now, one of the problems of, and the reason why they had to shut down the, the nuclear power plant in the Brookhaven National Lab is because tritium was found in well water. Water with uh, hydrogen threes in it is dangerous because that is a beta emitter and beta emitter is a mutagen. So they're finding tritium in their well water. Okay, this ain't the Spider-Man movie, all right? And that was a dangerous thing to have. And so they had to shut that down. Okay, so you should be aware of, you know, again, Brookhaven National Lab is 20 minutes from the school or 25 minutes or so. All right, so it's something you should recognize. Any case, so we have these control rods, whether they're made of water, or other different types of compounds that absorb neutrons. If these don't work, and you could have this reaction go, it won't explode because they never have enough of these fuels to have um, an explosion. And there's a word that, uh, that I'm missing right now, enough of that to make an explosion, but um, it can produce so much heat that it could melt the reactant wall and then all types of gamma beta radiation could be released into the environment. And that's what a meltdown is. We've heard some very famous ones, okay, the Chernobyl, or the, um, uh, the one in Japan a few years back. So it's important to realize that although we get no CO2 emissions here and we don't have any fossil fuels that we're dependent upon, boy, there is a risk associated with having these. So in any case, getting back to reality. Okay, let's move on and I'm gonna erase this, clear all my drawings. Let's go on to the next slide here and let's talk about uh, these uranium pellets because a, a positive is that a small amount of fuel gives you a tremendous amount of energy here. Okay, so let me talk about this. Okay, so these are the actual size of the pellets and these are now the weapons grade uranium. So the size of a thimble, okay? And so uh, one uranium pellet creates as much energy as one ton of coal or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. Okay, and here's a great one, three barrels of oil. I guess each one of these is 55 gallons. So think about that. Tremendous amount of energy, okay, that a small amount of fuel will give us. And again, it doesn't give us any CO2 emissions, okay, that these other forms of energy that we currently use to, to, to power our economy or our homes, all right? So the problem though, there is a risk. So what happens to the nuclear fuel, okay? So a single fuel assembly spends about five years in a reactor. Typically every 18 to 24 months, a nuclear power plant stops generating electricity to replace a third of its fuel assemblies, which is the control, I'm sorry, with the fuel rods. The radioactive byproducts remains. Not all the, not all the uh, uranium uh, fissions and some of it just uh, is sitting there and also the the, the, the splitting isn't always stable compounds that don't have, are not radioactive themselves. So we're dealing with this goop of unfission uranium and the byproducts with themselves are radioactive. So we have this waste. After the used fuel assemblies have cooled to the point where they no longer need to be stored underwater, they're, remo they're removed from the pools and safely, and that's an important word, are safely stored in the plant in large containers made of steel reinforced concrete. Every nuclear power plant stores fuel as the industry awaits or stores used fuel. 
Huh, they say used fuel, it's usually nuclear waste and awaits the completion of either a consolidated interim storage site or permanent disposal repository. Party people, we used to put this in barrels and ship it into some mountain facility. Well, guess what? Those barrels are made of iron or some metal. They oxidize and they leaked and they, uh, expo they exposed the environment to unbelievably long, long half-lives. We have parts of our country that no longer can be inhabited because of our storage of nuclear uh, uh, waste material. Guess what we do with them now? We store them on site, every nuclear power plant, okay? Because we don't have a way to dispose of it, okay, is sitting at each site being stockpiled. So think about a terrorist threat. You break into the facility and you take a regular bomb, explode it, and that'll be like a biggest dirty bomb. Dirty bomb is just basically pushing all of this, what, uh, nuclear waste into the air. So these nuclear power plants are ticking bombs in the sense that we're just building up waste. Now, there has been some research, okay? They've been, uh, lately, there has been some research using algae or bacteria that are consuming some of these radioactive materials and producing safe ones. I don't know how that's been going, but there was some initial research there. Some people say, hey, shoot up in space. Oh, what comes up? could possibly come down. Can you imagine putting that stuff in a rocket and the rocket explodes? I mean, or what if it comes back into our environment? So you can't just throw it in space. We've got to figure out a way to do that. So there's a big negative here, okay? And if you didn't already notice, we're surrounded by nuclear power plants. There's the Pilgrim facility, okay, in Massachusetts. And now look at the years. That's another problem with our nuclear power plants is they're getting older. And as they get older, if they're not upkept, okay, boy, there's a potential for problem. Look at the age of when these were all built, okay? And they're still running, okay? The Seabrook is the, one of the youngest, 1990, okay? That's still many years old, okay? So these are some very old facilities. Look where we live. We have the Indian, uh, Indian Point, okay? Not that far from us. Also, there's the Millstone, okay, in Connecticut. So uh, we're surrounded in Northeast by these nuclear power plants that are doing what? Yes, they're helping us conserve the use of fossil fuels or limiting the use, but they may be posing a bigger risk by either meltdowns or the, the buildup of nuclear waste. These are things you have to know for the curriculum, okay? And they're getting older, all right? So it's a big thing, all right? And so... What's the problems? Well, here's the, my, I grew up in 1979. I remember the three mile accident where there was a partial meltdown in one of these reactors. And uh, this, remember this is a condensed, the reactors below. And so there was a leakage of some radioactivity that came out. Uh, it wasn't major. People say that leukemia jumped 300% in the area and there was some increase in cancers, but it was essentially um, fixed really quickly and there wasn't a lot of energy and it's a big, um, talk about, and this is, by the way, in Pennsylvania, right? It's the, um, it's the one right here, the three mile, uh, it's in Pennsylvania, I forget which one, once that thing disappears. Yeah, there's a three mile right there. Okay, so not that far from us, right? And, and think, about, think about how weather occurs. If we had a major problem, okay, well, we don't live in Pennsylvania, but weather travels, what, eastward, okay? So something to think about, all right? And of course, everyone knows about the Chernobyl, although Russia hasn't been very forthcoming, this was supposedly the worst disaster besides the um, Japanese where we had a complete meltdown of the core, okay? And so many people perished. In fact, they were building, if you don't know about Chernobyl, they were building a actual uh, city for young Metro Russians to not move to other countries. Russia was worried about the um, uh, exportation of the loss of their young uh, mines who go to, you know, cooler cities. So they were building one near the Chernobyl, and that, of course, is a ghost town, okay, because of that catastrophic event, okay. And supposedly, um, this is an older facility that wasn't upkept, and it was a, they were running a test on the coolant system. It didn't work, and again, the reaction got out of control. It didn't explode, but it got so hot, okay, it burned away the reactor core and all and spilled out into the environment. And they're still um, having many, many problems in this area because of that genetic mutations. Now, what they've done since then is I think they've put a big concrete, um, uh, lead concrete wall around this. But any case, and then lately we've had, um, not lately, but many, a few years ago, it's, it grows every year, 2001 Japan nuclear crisis too. This was just as potentially dangerous where we had these reactors uh, 
fully lose their core as well, okay? And this affected the fishing industry and, and, and some of that actually got to the California coast, okay? So look at these reactors actually burned out. All right, and you should know about your Long Island history. We built a nuclear power plant, at least LIPA, that was an electric company, okay, that was, that was running Long Island at the time, and they built a nuclear power plant. And I remember uh, growing up and people protesting, okay, this power plant because we had it so close to us. And I remember growing up, they had little sirens given up, okay, and these sirens were supposed to tell us to evacuate Long Island. And one of the, the biggest things about this power plant was that well, party people, um, we could not, we could not get off the island fast enough. How do you evacuate an island like this? So eventually they decommissioned the power plant. It was running, I think, at two to six or eight percent, and they're ready to full, put on full blast. Okay, and then they let it. They said no. We, we they they basically succumbed to the pressure. By the way your parents and I are still paying for this billion dollar effort. Okay, so the bills that piled up to build this, we are actually still paying that as part of our high electrical rates. So they decommissioned, took all the fuel off. There's no reactivity in here. In fact, you can drive by this facility. Um, obviously now there's a lot of um, plants and forests. You can actually see the uh, big condenser tube here if you drive in Shoreham. So pretty interesting, but that's part of your, um, part of your history. So the advantages. No air pollution or greenhouse gas emitted. Large amount of energy from a small amount of fuel. Decreased dependence on fossil fuels. Disadvantage, radioactive waste that builds up. Potential for a meltdown, as I talked about. All right. All right. So I'm going to leave you here. And we have one more to talk about. We'll talk about um, fusion next time. And we will also talk about the bombs dropped and those things. So we have one more lecture left. Okay. So I'm going to stop my share. Hope you had a great day. Um, I will post something, okay, um, and to review this part of this lecture. So have a great day, and we'll talk to you. Bye-bye. Hope this helped. Bye, Mr. Grotsky. Bye! All right. <laughs>